For a period of 25 years, Barbara Kaiser founded and was the director of two child care centers and an after-school program. She has a master's degree in educational administration from McGill University, which gives her a firm theoretical foundation, but above all, her perspective is practical, realistic, and compassionate stemming from decades of working with actual children, families, and teachers in real situations. Barbara is a true friend to Ohio AUIC, and I count her as my own personal friend and a friend to early childhood educators. It is my honor to welcome Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Kim. I'm very honored to be part of this. Um, because this is a really hard time for a lot of us. And as some of some states and provinces are starting to reopen, I think we're all trying to figure out how are we going to adjust to this new normal. Our childcare centers have been shuttered for months. Children have been isolated in their homes. And no one really knows for sure what the long-term impact of this pandemic will be. So I think what we're all struggling with is far more unknowns than knowns and how can we make this work for all the children so i've become very compassionate about this in the hopes that i can help support children and educators and families to be able to really adjust to this in the best way possible so the objectives for this webinar are to understand the impact of trauma on both the educators you and the children's behavior and covid19 is a traumatic event. So as long, I think that is something we all have to begin to accept. It is listed under toxic stress. And for many young children, those of you who are familiar with adverse childhood effects, this will be one of the ACEs they are going to carry with them throughout life. Um, we're going to look at developing program changes so we can ensure the health and safety at all, of all. And these changes are not changes by me. These are changes recommended by this, primarily by the CDC and ways of looking at them as to how they're going to impact you and how are they going to impact the children and the families. And learning ways to mitigate those required changes so that children feel safe, because I think that's the most important thing. And I sadly believe that when kids do come back, there is going to be more challenging behavior than there was in the past. And we need to look at it through a different lens. So I'm going to do a sort of quick overview of looking at trauma-informed practice when responding to challenging behavior. So when we look at this, I think we need to realize one of the things about this event has really shown everybody no matter, probably throughout the world, how important childcare is to the economy and how parents can't really work that, even work from home effectively sometimes when their children are at home, from the ages of infancy all the way to university, if they have limited access to the internet and things like that. So we need to really understand that it is a significant factor in the opening of the economy but my greatest worry is that we have to be very careful when we go back that we don't ignore the emotional impact of not only what the children have been through in terms of being isolated and sheltered at home but also once they come out into the real world what's the impact of seeing people in masks and remaining six feet apart um, most of the recommendations are to leave that when children arrive at the child care center they should, parents should leave them at the door and not enter the center. What's that going to feel like? Maybe they won't even be greeted by their own teacher. Maybe there will be a, a person assigned to greeting everybody to limit the amount of contact. So we really need to think about the impact it's having on them. And in the early days, we thought that kids were not really that um, susceptible to COVID-19. And recently we're finding that there are related illnesses that are quite severe that our children are coming down with that are related to COVID-19. And it's very important to think, well, I was just talking to Kim about it. They've been so sheltered. They haven't, very few of them have really gotten sick. What about when they come out into the real world and they integrate with each other and they socialize and families from all over, maybe some who've taken a bus to get there, 
educators who've had to use public transport to get there, what's going to happen to them once they are exposed to a lot of different people? So we need to be very sure that we do this well, we do this right, and our kids don't become sacrificial lambs so that the economy can continue to grow. So I'm hoping everyone will use their best judgment and it will really be a way in which we're helping kids return to normal, continue to grow, and be emotionally safe and strong. So I have a question that I wanted to ask you, and if you could put this in the chat box, um, because we decided not to use the poll, in, just in case it, it kind of messed up the webinar a little bit with the internet. So what are you most concerned about? Is it your health, the children's health, meeting all those required standards, the children's readjustment, taking care of your own family so that now you're going to be exposed to all these kids and their families and you're going home to your family. And those of you who are still home and working from home, if you are, taking care of your own family can be a big issue. Or all of the above. If you could indicate in the chat box with one of these letters what your concerns seem to be. And Kim, maybe if you can keep track of that for me. That would be great. If you're there. I will be looking at those. Thank you. How are we doing? I'm having a hard time seeing a response unless people are just entering it in. So I'm going to wait here a second. OK. Um, Maybe okay, now I'm seeing it. Okay. Uh, lots of, wow, lots of varieties. Um, <laughs> I was, the, the largest is F, all of the above. <laughs> right. Uh, although um, I'm continuing to see, uh, I'm seeing good representation with every letter. So you've certainly identified um, the issues that they are concerned with, but the lar very large majority of people are concerned with everything you've identified. Okay. Well, hopefully we will get through to everything. That's my intention of being able to kind of cover this all so that when you do start, and in Ohio you're starting, I believe, very shortly, that you feel confident and ready to start. Um, okay. So, when we look at the pandemic and the widespread emotional trauma it's causing, it's also important to remember that a crisis like this can reveal both strengths and vulnerabilities. It doesn't have to be so negative. And I think a lot of things that we are learning about ourselves and hopefully systems are learning about themselves and childcare is taking a really good look at what do we need to do and why is this so difficult? Um, how should it be statewide, citywide? Should it be national? How do we actually respond to this? And how quickly we respond to bolster the strengths and mitigate our vulnerabilities is absolutely critical. The pandemic and subsequent stay at home orders are things none of us have ever experienced before. So we don't really know how to process it. Our brains don't have experience to really understand how can we make these informed decisions? But we can't ignore the emotional needs of the, or those, our emotional needs or those of the children. And we all have to ask ourselves, how has this impacted us? And how has it impacted the children? And we need to stop and think about that before we open the doors up to the kids before they come. And as I mentioned, the pandemic has really been identified as a trauma. And a trauma is a psychologically distressing event that's outside the range of normal experience and involves a sense of fear and helplessness. And I think just those few words describe how a lot of us are feeling. It can be any event that undermines yours or a child's sense of physical or emotional safety or poses a threat to the safety of those you love. Once again, I think we can relate to that. And the ongoing sense that your own health and welfare and the health and welfare of those that you love is out of our control makes it even harder and increases that sense of hopelessness and worry. So this is part of the trauma that we are all experiencing. 
And in some ways, the fact that it is such a global event, I think helps us be more empathetic and helps us really understand um, what everyone is going through, because I'm sure we're all going through very similar things. It's also important to recognize that stress is not necessarily a bad thing. We experience positive stress almost every day. And it's usually mild and brief, and we have a way of resolving it. And young children, usually, in order to resolve it, have supportive adults. It's what attachment is all about. Um, and when they have a good relationship and are securely attached, if they cry, if they fall down and they're stressed, or they get upset because somebody, somebody else is playing with the toy they want, but if they have somebody who cares about them, they, can, they get through it and they learn. They learn a lot from positive stress. And tolerable stress can be more serious. It's also temporary. And also there is a caring other person, whether you're an adult or a child, who is really there to support you. But toxic stress is different. And if you look at this in terms of the pandemic, these adverse events are intense. And I think some of us, especially I hope there are very few people here today who have actually lost a loved one, but some of us have really had a very intense experience. It's frequent because it's daily. It's sizable. And at this point, I think we can all agree it's very prolonged. And what happens then is that our cortisol levels, our blood pressure, our brain starts to function in a very different way. And it becomes much easier to turn on that stress system and not be able to respond well to others or to challenges, um, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and it becomes much harder to turn it off. And what we really need to learn is how to turn it off. How can we calm ourselves down, recognize our stress so that when we are working with kids who are also going to feel stressed out, that we don't stress them out further, that we are there to calm them down because we can calm ourselves down and we can role model to them how to do it. So looking at your own stress level, first of all, you need to be aware of your triggers. Do you know, have you thought about over these weeks and months, what has triggered some of that, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just jumped on him, or I can't believe I reacted like that. Um, what are some of your triggers? And also to know what are some of the signs of stress. And when I was doing this research, some of it actually surprised me that, wow, I, I know exactly what that means. I didn't realize that was part of stress, especially this first one of feeling tired and wired at the same time, because I know I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping. So as a result, I, I, I feel I'm kind of exhausted, but I'm so wired. So how does that work together? Being very jumpy and hypervigilant, something drops and you just immediately look and wonder what was that? Feeling inexplicably irritable, angry or angry, getting angry at the drop of a hat when you never used to. And some of us become numb. Some of us turn that off and just distance ourselves. Are you finding it hard to focus or concentrate? I know that, you know, that, hey, I thought this is time to read a book. And boy, do I have a hard time when I put the book down and pick it up the next day remembering what I just read. It's really hard. And I think a lot of us are feeling anxious. We feel guilty sometimes about not doing enough. but you know, given the regulations and the requirements in Nova Scotia, where I live, we have a bubble. So I can now, and, and when you're part of the bubble, which is only up to five people and two families, so I can now reconnect with my grandson, who's three and a half years old, um, and he's thrilled that I'm in his bubble. He finds that a great way to describe it. But before the bubble, you know, I didn't even know how can I help my daughter? What can I do to make it easier? Because she was working from home and you know taking care of a three and a half year old even though her husband was there just can be very hard um overeating or eating too little um chocolate and jelly beans have become my staple and then sometimes feeling physical ailments which you never felt before so we really need to look at how many of these um factors of stress are you experiencing and probably you know many of us are experiencing quite a few we need to recognize it. Yes, we are stressed. And because I mentioned it's a global trauma, it's called a collective trauma. And it's repeated, it's prolonged, it's um, in a constant, we're in a constant state of elevated arousal. 
We live day in and day out in a fight or flight mode, which taxes the brain and the body. And that's when our adrenaline, when we're getting, having an amygdala hijack, and the only part of our brain that's working is our amygdala, which can fight, flight, or freeze, and we're not in control of our thought, of our thought processes. We're not in control of the thinking part of our brain, of our, um, lo of our frontal, pro, pro, front, pro, of our cortex, of our prefrontal cortex. It has lasting effects, especially for the kids. And it can raise the risk of developing subsequent health problems. Once again, if you look at the ACEs, it's very related. And uncertainty is a major trigger of stress that can boil over and into clinical significant levels of anxiety. The ongoing stress and anxiety, um, am I washing my hands enough? Did I clean the surfaces? Am I going out too much? All those things we worry about on a daily basis. And that chronic stress level leaves the brain swimming in cortisol. And so therefore, we really need to look at how can we re-engage our prefrontal cortex, the area of our brain that is responsible for our decision-making, our problem-solving, and our emotional regulation. And until we can connect with it, we're not really there or able to support others. So it's extremely important to be aware of it. So I'd like you to think about what COVID-19 is, just think about, because it's a webinar. If we were in person and we had more time, we could talk about it. But I think it's great that we have this opportunity to get together. So what part of the COVID-19 has been most stressful for you? Is it this being sheltered at home? Is it missing your family? What has been the most stressful for you? And how have these events affected you? In what way has it been so stressful and why? Have you reached out to others for support via the internet, via Facebook, via phone? You know, how many of you have really still stayed in touch with those people that care about you and that you care about, which is so very, very important. And I hope that we can all sort of stop and think about what have we learned about ourselves? There's a lot we didn't have to stop and think about before. There's a lot I've learned about who I am when I'm facing a situation like this. How resilient am I? How positive am I? Am I seeing this all through a negative lens? Um, what, how am I coping? Have you assisted someone else in going through a similar experience, which has been found to be extremely helpful? I happen to be in the range of the elderly at risk, so I haven't really reached out to others in order to do grocery shopping for them or see what I could bring. But I have to say my neighbors have all come to us, our younger neighbors, and asked if they can bring us something every time they go to the store. Now, I don't pass anybody. I live in the country, kind of. And I don't pass anybody without waving at a car, waving at a neighbor, um, all just trying to maintain contact. What is that telling us? And maybe this is something we're learning in a positive way. And think about the obstacles you've overcome. You know, sometimes we've learned a lot about how we deal with situations. Those of you with little kids, those of you with partners, those of you that might be living in a crowded area, how have you overcome some obstacles that you've had to deal with? And what has helped you make you feel more helpful about the future? Um, these are all very important things we need to stop and think about. Um, because this is how we learn from an experience, and I think we need to turn this into a learning experience in order to help ourselves and support ourselves from going through this. Another piece of information that I learned when researching this is a phrase called disenfranchised grief. I'd never heard this phrase before. And what it is, and when I started to read about it, I realized, boy, this really describes how I'm feeling and probably how a lot of us are feeling. And it's any type of grief or part of it that a society or part of it doesn't expect or openly acknowledge or allow people to express or publicly mourn. So when you think about it um, and think about it in regard to this, the loss of the old normal, that's pretty, you know, that can be for some of us very sad. If you think about how hard it is for us sometimes to not complain or to tr have people understand how much we miss seeing the kids that we work with. And when there are people who are dying, when there are people who maybe can't put food on their table. And finally, the lack of recognition 
leads to a more complicated form of grief. And I have to mention, I'm an American, I have dual citizenship. I live in Canada now. And when 9-11 occurred, I grew up in New York City and I was glued in front of the television set all day. And nobody here really understood what I was going through. And I cried and I cried and I didn't know how to talk to people about it. It just really hit me hard. And it wasn't until the NAEYC had their conference in November in Anaheim, and they had a special session for 9-11. And it was a large group, and I was surrounded by people who felt the way I felt. And it was the first time I really felt it was okay to have the feelings that I had. And what a difference that made. So talk to people. Um, a lot of people are feeling this, and they don't realize it. Talk to those who do what you do. Um, it's a very important piece of the puzzle in helping us get through this in a positive way. We need to look at what has the impact of sheltering in place had upon us? How has it made it more stressful? What has occurred? Were we anxious? How did it affect our anxiety? How did it accept our fear and worry about our safety? Did it make it seem way more serious when we couldn't leave our home? And many of us still can't really leave our homes. Uh, was there an uncertainty or anger about how long you're going to remain sheltered? And I think that unknown piece has been very, very hard for us. And when you feel isolated or lonely, and for people who live alone, I think this has got to have been extremely difficult. And then we're all worried about, well, if we're sheltering in place, many of us don't have an income. So how are you going to make those ends meet? And then what about the changes in eating and sleeping patterns when in the initially you couldn't go out? I mean, now we can go for walks, we can do a lot of things, get more exercise. I think that helps. But sheltering in place is never something I had experienced and it really required a huge readjustment. And then we look at social media. Is it our friend or our foe? It's really allowed us to do things like this. It's allowed us to connect with friends and loved ones. It's been a wonderful source of information. And all of a sudden, we can stream movies and television. And the, they, that universe has really opened up and very generously so that when we are home or at night, we can just sort of cuddle up and watch TV or old movies. But on the other hand, it's also been a source of way too much information. And it's made it much harder for us to turn it off and to really look at ways to do something else instead of constantly focus on how many people have passed, how many people are sick, what is the next regulation, how is my daughter, what are we going to do? Um, we also need to look at sources of misinformation. There's a lot of information, but whenever you receive information, whether it's from a friend or a, a, a stranger, look at the date. Sometimes the information that people post happened three years ago, and it has it might relate to what's happening today, but it isn't how people are thinking or what they are saying today. And often it's very inaccurate. So always check the sources. Know which sources are reliable and focus on those. It's very, very important. Or we can really end up misleading ourselves and going deeper and deeper into a hole. We need to manage our stress. And we need to remember when we do talk to our friends and we do connect, that everyone reacts differently to these types of situations. And how you are responding is going to depend on your own background, your culture, and your support system or the community you live in. So don't expect everyone to feel the way you feel and understand how those aspects of your life are really impacting how you're dealing with this stress. Name your feelings and build your resilience. It's so important to become as resilient as you possibly can. And what you need to remember is that resilience isn't something you have or don't have. It's dynamic, it's developmental, and it develops over time. Once again, it depends heavily on the context. Sometimes factors that protect you in one context may actually render you more vulnerable in others. It allows you to moderate your feelings and your thoughts. It's your emotional resilience is fundamental to your ability to be effective. But you need to remember that being resilient doesn't mean that you don't feel stressed. It doesn't mean that you don't feel sad. It means that you have coping mechanisms that can get you out of that deep hole. It helps you so that adversity 
isn't overwhelming and it can protect you from stress later. It's not going to make the stress disappear. We need to look at how can we be more resilient in a situation like this? So try and find meaning in this situation, recognizing the strengths you didn't know you had before, reaching out to those friends and how much that now means to you. What is that new meaning of those friends? Who are you reaching out to? Are you, and how are they responding to you? Are you connecting with your colleagues? That's just as important. I hope that those of you who are educators, um, your director is connecting with you. Those of you who are social service or um, support people working, I hope you are connecting with those that you work with so that you can see how they're doing. It's all about those relationships and turn those feelings of isolation into a sense of purpose. How can you work together? And I think if we stop and think about even the meaning of masks or social distancing, it's to protect ourselves, but it's primarily to protect others when you think about masks. So we are learning a lot about how much do we care? Are we wearing those masks? How much do we care about protecting other people, even if we have no symptoms? Because asymptomatic COVID-19 is probably one of the biggest threats that we're all facing. So we need to remember that when challenging behavior occurs, we need to be our, st our strongest. We're not only dealing with how serious this pandemic is, but also the uncertainty of the long-term consequences and how long it's going to be before we return to, I hope, even a newer normal rather than the old normal. It makes it hard to focus and hard to self-regulate. So we need to really remember we are a role model of healthy social and emotional behavior for every child that we are in touch with, and even for our friends. The stronger we can be, the stronger we can help them be. So one of the things that research is showing are there are ways to support yourself in these stressful times. The uncertainty that confronting uncomfortable feelings and reassuring yourself can help you feel more in control of your life. Realizing you've made it this far, and we all have through this crisis, you're still pushing back against the uncertainty. You are building your resilience. Get into a rhythm. The hints of predictability can help us all deal with emotional um, distractions. Building those what they call emotional pillars that we can lean on. Curve out some time to be by yourself in a positive way so that you can not feel so overwhelmed by those social demands, especially those of you who are home with children. Find a place. Your kids need a place and you know it where they can go and isolate themselves and just take deep breaths, well, so do you. And think outside of yourself. Turn your attention to emotionally supporting the others and can act as a form of mindfulness and short circuses, sh can short circus your worries because you're not suddenly so worried you feel like you're doing something. Most important of all, find a balance that works for you. This is not going to be the same for everybody. So find your own balance and see what you can do. I just want to show you a video clip, which I hope will work, because mindfulness becomes very important. And I know there's a lot of resistance sometimes to meditating and thinking about mindfulness because it's like, oh, out there. But really, the more mindful we can be and the more mindful we can help children be, the more easily we can self-regulate, the more easily we can help others to self-regulate. So I'm just going to show you this short video. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. I'm going to give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, driving down the road and somebody cuts you off from traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. 
the proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. So let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. And it's a superpower that you are in control of, that you can actually engage in, that you can discover, that you can build. And what we often talk about is something called everyday resilience. And this will make you a better teacher because you will be better able to foster a positive, inclusive classroom culture if you are in control of yourself. You will be better able to provide positive feedback, reinsurance, and encouragement, which kids are going to need now more than ever. You will be better able to help children learn to understand and express their feelings if you are in control of your feelings, if you are not dealing with that amygdala hijack the entire time, but you can, you, you can engage that prefrontal cortex and listen, which is going to be hard sometimes. It really will be. You can encourage the building of trusting and cooperative relationships, and you can provide much more flexible learning and assessment opportunities. And most of all, hopefully, regardless of this situation, at the end of the day, you will have thought about it and thought, you know, I had a good day. That was fun. Because for most of us, it is fun. Working with little kids, listening to the funny things they have to say and the things they do and the surprises we get every day, we should have fun. We should be smiling. Think about your body language. Are you smiling? Don't forget to smile. Give yourself the grace you need. Set realistic goals. Recognize what you've learned and take care of yourself. It's okay not to be okay. We're not gonna all be super people, but we have to do the best that we possibly can. And I know, you know that we all are trying. So what we need to think about is that this very challenging situation has given us opportunities to redefine ourselves as kinder, more compassionate human beings, and that we have hopefully found strengths inside ourselves that we never cultivated before. So go back and go in that classroom with your head up thinking, gee, I've learned a lot about who I am and what I can provide and offer to other people. And if we look at how children have experienced toxic stress or trauma and feel that their life circumstances are beyond their control, um, which I think they really do. I know that my little grandson, you know, he's, he, he wants to go to the playground. He wants to go outside. He wants to see his friends and he doesn't understand, you know, he can't. Um, in 2012, the American Academy of Pediatrics said there was a landmark warning that toxic stress and trauma could harm children for life, which is what the ACEs study is all about. And what makes it so dangerous is that the adverse events that evoke young children's stress response are intense and frequent and sizable. No adults are there to protect them. So instead, you need to be there. You need to be there to protect them, to give them that sense of safety. And you can't do that unless you're feeling good about yourself. We need to remember that there are lots of trauma-related experiences. This is not the first time that children have experienced trauma. Um, there's domestic violence, there's incarcerated family members, there's homelessness, of which there are 5 million children in America who are now homeless. There's discrimination, there's fostered, revolving foster care. There are all these different things. And what we need to remember is that they are saying that basically COVID-19 is a disaster. It falls into this category. And children process these events, process disasters, with a very limited understanding of what a disaster is all about. They also each process it in a very different way. 
And you might find there are some kids that are going to walk back into your group and just seem fine, like nothing ever happened. And two weeks later, all of a sudden, there'll be a meltdown. For some of them, it takes a long time, which starts right away. And for others, it takes a while before it actually has that detrimental impact on their sense of well-being. Oops. Um, I think that's the next slide. Yes, okay, sorry. Um, we need to look at how children, with, if you take the disaster, I'm gonna just move it back for a second. If you take how the disaster is impacting a, a child, those who are already experiencing domestic violence, that just becomes an additional. Those who have exper experienced an incarcerated family member, children living in a homeless situation with nowhere to go are extremely at risk and very frightened. Discrimination, look at what is happening to people of color in the United States in terms of the impact of COVID-19. So all of these other trauma-related experiences that some kids are going through make this disaster even harder for them. So we need to remember that um, for some kids, they are experiencing this pandemic in very different ways. Children who are living in an urban versus a rural setting. If you're in an apartment in New York City, and often in New York, you know, there might be four kids in two bedrooms and you don't even have a balcony. So how do you deal with that chaos and not being able to leave? Social economic status. Um, they are discovering that dependent upon your income often affects how able one is to cope with sheltering in place and the other issues related. Parental stress due to change in available income all of a sudden. Parents are so worried about how are they going to make ends meet. And maybe where there was no domestic violence before, that stress can result in domestic violence that the kids are witnessing and maybe even being affected by. Children of essential workers who are going to work every day and how the essential workers are feeling when they come home and the fear of, of exposing their children. And maybe they don't even connect with their families because they're so afraid. Um, children living in families who were at risk before, single children versus those with siblings. If you're an only child, you don't have anyone to play with. And children who've lost a loved one. And that can be very, very hard because the family is grieving, they, they have nowhere to go. Um, there are lots of things on which is impacting how ki what kids are having to deal with and how well they can deal with it. Sheltering in place, has imposed an unprecedented social experiment on the country's children and, and our countries, because now there's US and Canada here, that, ha that ch could have lingering effects. Sheltering in place has not been easy for many young children, especially those in the small apartments. It becomes so difficult um, with poverty and children who attended daycare before sheltering in place miss their friends, their teachers, their routines, routines and their activities. And, that's my little grandson, who clearly is not happy to sheltering in place. So we need to remember, too, that many children who are now locked down at home, who have experienced domestic violence, um, either themselves or witnessed it, are in a situation which is even more scary for them. Because kids who are in this situation at home, often childcare and school is their safe place, and they can't go there. Their teacher or you, their educator, make a difference because when they see you, they feel safe and you're not there. So they are really struggling with how they can cope with the domestic violence that, that you were perhaps the key to making it okay for them. So those kids are gonna come to you and if they were having trouble understanding their feelings and behaving appropriately before, they are going to be extremely at risk. And more important than anything, you need to remember that you are their safe place. You are their safe person. You need to listen and understand um, because they will need you. And you will probably be able to tell because I'm sure you know your kids. It's also important to remember that kids, you know, even if you're not talking to them directly or you don't think they're old enough to understand, they're picking up on messages that they're hearing um, either on the news or hearing their parents talk, or just because they're asking certain questions like, how come I can't see grandma, or why can't I go to school? And I have to say, with my 
three and a half year old grandson one night when my daughter was putting him to sleep. She had no idea he had any idea of what was going on. And one night she was putting him to sleep and he said, tomorrow the virus will be gone. And she said, what? And he said, it's going to be gone tomorrow and I can go to see my friends. I can go, he misses the playground. I can go to the playground. So he was picking up on it. She didn't even know he knew the word virus. So there's a lot we don't really understand that kids understand or know or don't understand. So it's very important to realize they're not coming to you with no knowledge. They're probably coming to you with a kind of sense of confusion um, about what's going on. And when we look at children who've experienced trauma or toxic stress before COVID-19 and now, um, because of this increased level of hormone, the hormone cortisol, and also adrenaline and the lack of being able to connect with that thinking part of their brain are having difficulty learning unless they feel safe and supported. So when they get back to, to childcare or school, learning, teaching, it, it's, that's not the most important thing. Helping them to feel safe and supported, building their social emotional skills so they feel part of a group and cared for, those are the things to focus on. They aren't trying to push your buttons when they engage in challenging behavior, but they are literally in constant overdrive, feeling very vulnerable, hypervigilant, and often reacting inappropriately to behaviors of other children. So it's very important for you to understand where they're coming from so that you can respond appropriately and provide them with the support that they need. So when you think about it, most children use a combination of hyperarousal and disassociation in response to a perceived threat. They don't all respond the same way. It is important to remember that it's the perception of threat that induces the response. So when they get back, if they are being hypervigilant, even if nothing that you think is threatening is happening, if they perceive it as threatening, it can put them in that overdrive mode again. So when that threat or traumatic event is long lasting or intense, there's no reliable adult around to help deal with it. That stress system resells itself to take over the job and to support, to defend the child all hours of the day and night. So they are always on that hypervigilant level. As a result, it overloads that developing brain and there's no really ability for them to calm down and to listen and to learn and to socialize appropriately with their peers. Sometimes that threat can be internal, like a feeling like I'm being anxious or powerless. I'm all alone, nobody cares about me, nobody knows how I'm feeling. Or it can be something like a verbal cue. Maybe you say something or a child says something that triggers it. When a child's stress system is always on high alert, the child sees the world as a dangerous place. And that's why you need to first help them feel safe so that challenging behavior does not become the only way they feel they can protect themselves. I just thought this was a very interesting graphic about a child's brain. If you look at the one to your left, I believe it's your left, um, which is full of colors, that's a healthy brain. If you look at the one on the right, that's a brain of a child who's been abused. But it's really basically a brain of a child who has been um, traumatized. It doesn't have to be abuse. So we need to recognize that unless we can support them and help them feel strong, they are going to have, they're going down a very dangerous trajectory. And they're going to have trouble learning how to control themselves, learning how to focus, learning how to stay in, in to connect with others. We need to help them develop that strong, secure attachment. Most kids who have been, who have experienced trauma um, have disorganized attachment, which is a very serious form of attachment. Hopefully, if the only trauma these kids have experienced is COVID-19, that they are just feeling very insecure at the moment and they need to feel, again, to trust adults will meet their needs, to trust they're there for them, and to build that attachment with their families as well as with you. Early childhood trauma 
puts children at greatest risk for developing social processing, which is very, very important, as we all know. Um, and what happens is it will impair their ability to interact with their peers and, their, and you. Heightening threat vigilance can distract children from processing cognitive and social information and interfere with their ability to recognize emotion and respond appropriately to emotional cues. And this is why social emotional learning is the place to begin. These are the kids that are going to feel that if somebody bumps into them, they were pushed. So their automatic reaction is biased. They are convinced that anything that happens to them is hostile. So we have to be sure that we can help them understand and learn how to read those social cues, learn how to ask, learn how to understand what has happened. We can support children in reappraising these social situations by those social skills and teaching them proactively. Don't wait for something to happen. Have a plan that this is where you are going to begin and model the appropriate reactions to social situations by conveying your trust in adults and modeling your social interaction skills. But this is where we need to begin for very, very clear reasons, because kids' um, understanding of social cues can certainly be affected by this event. We also need to realize that executive function, which is the foundation for learning, is all of a sudden put at a very high risk because kids' um, cortisol level is constantly up there. And if you remember that your child's executive function enables them to be flexible, to move easily from one behavior to another, to transition from one activity to another, um, to listen, to make good decisions. And when their executive functions are, in, are impaired or just aren't functioning as well as they could be, even if they were before, there will be some recession. And so they are at high risk for aggressive and challenging behavior. They're going to have trouble sitting still. They're going to find it hard to control those impulses. Once again, social emotional learning, so important. Communicate their needs, understand other feelings, and form satisfying relationships. And this is why it is so important for you to begin. I, I can't emphasize more enough how important social emotional learning will be. This just shows the impact of childhood trauma, how COVID-19 may or may not, but probably will be impacting most of the kids when they return to school or childcare. It affects their cognition, their emotions, their relationships, their mental health, their behavior, and their brain development. So we really need to remember how hard it will be for some of these kids to engage, successfully engage in learning and um, we need to be prepared. We need to know how we can support them. So when we look at the cumulative effects of trauma and behavior, and I'm just doing this from infancy to preschooler, and remember it's cumulative. So an infant is going to be very difficult to soothe and comfort and resist being held, and may not even be interested in playing. Toddlers who maybe didn't have them before, our son and those that did before are probably going to have them have more temper tantrums, difficulty separating because they've now been with their families nonstop for weeks. Some may be withdrawn, others may be aggressive, and also refuse to be comforted. They don't want you to come. And preschoolers, in addition to being difficult to soothe, perhaps having temper tantrums, so this is all cumulative. You have are going to be hypervigilant and aggressive, preoccupied with perceived threats, unable to concentrate on anything else, and have trouble learning, processing, and retrieving information. And this is all because of the impact that trauma has on executive function. So please keep these things in mind. They're very, very important. These kids are not pushing your buttons. They still love you. They still want you to be there for them, but they're not quite sure what to do. And that's very, very important for you to understand. But when your center does reopen, navigating the new normal is not an easy task for anyone, the children, the families, or yourself. 
So you need to kind of take a deep breath, think about the things we talked about, think about how to build that resilience, how to be your strong best self so that you can be there for the kids and how to really know how, what are you going to do? How, what are you going to focus on? How are you going to approach it? This is not just a regular transition back to school or childcare. Everyone has been through a tough time. The children have sensed the global stress. It adds up and their resilience can be run down over time. Your sensitivity and your patience are key ingredients for helping children and their families make a successful move back to a childcare setting. And remember, children are not just by themselves. You're there, we, we almost need to be not superhuman because we, we're not, but we need to remember the role that families play and we need to address parents' fears. How many of you are parents whose children are also going to be returning to school or childcare? How concerned are you about their safety? How can you help the families understand that you will do your best to protect them? You can't guarantee that they won't get sick. Actually, I was just reading a story and I don't know where it was, I'm sorry, but in the United States somewhere, where at one center, a mother discovered she was positive. At another center, a caregiver discovered she was positive. And at another center, a child did. So we can't promise, but we can certainly reassure them that that's our commitment. You need to clearly describe what you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, and if your center has, you know, needs to communicate to families. And I think, you know, it's probably best. Yes, the director should do what they should do. But if you are an educator, you need to build that relationship with the family because you're the one who the family is trusting the child to. So connect with them. Let them know what you're going to emphasize, how you're going to protect them, what the new procedures are, how you're going to implement them. Um, and you need to reach out frequently. And I'm hoping that while this was all taking place, that you were reaching out to the kids and you were also reaching out to the families. I'm sure they needed to hear from you. Maybe you could give them some suggestions on how best to deal with a three-year-old or a four-year-old who just is running around the house and won't get focused. But their worries are important. And as communities reopen, we have, they have concerns about their child's safety. To try and think about how you feel and use what you're learning about how you feel about your children to help support the, children, the families of the children that you're working with. We need to address the children's fears. And we need to realize that regardless of what we have to do when the kids come back, the children impacted by disaster are going to have a lot of concerns. They're going to want to know Will I be okay? Will you get sick thinking about their families? Is it safe to touch things? Can I play with my friends? Coping with the uncertainty around COVID-19 is challenging social isolation, sheltering in place for an extended period of time, maybe not really understanding why and uncertainty about what all this means for their friends, their family members that they usually see on a regular basis are just a few of the concerns young children have at this time. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Harvard Medical School and Child Trends have some excellent suggestions for communicating with young children that will support their emotional well-being. So um, I suggest that you look and see what you can do. But we need to also remember that the impact is not necessarily going to appear immediately and that Often what will happen is, in addition to all of these things, understanding the required limits. How come I, if you have a classroom that has a barrier now, how come I can't cross that barrier? How come I can't play with that friend? Um, these are all gonna be very hard for these children. And recovering from a disaster is a long process. This is not going to happen immediately. You might have a child that will walk in one day feeling great about himself and doing terrific and the next day fall apart. This is hard. So in addition to not appearing immediately, um, it also, the recovery is not going to be consistent. When we look at what the new normal is and the emphasis upon helping children to understand how their actions influence the health and safety of others, but how are they going to really deal with this new environment? 
This is a photograph from Denmark at a school that opened quite a while ago, teaching kids about safe distances that they needed to keep. Um, Kim sent me the Ohio regulations, and I wasn't really aware of the fact there would be people from outside of Ohio. But I just wanted to point out that there are a lot of issues that are coming up in terms of mandatory and re recommended best practice. And one of the things that's probably the hardest for a lot of childcare centers are the new ratios. I'm going to go through some of these one by one, but when you look at the new ratios, the transitional ratios, in Ohio, it used to be infants were one to five, and I, I, I think this meant that the group could have six kids. Now it's one to four with a maximum of six. If you look at toddlers, it went from one to seven to one to six. Preschoolers went from one to 12 to one to nine and only nine in the room as a maximum. So some of you have large enough rooms that you can divide them, but others might not. So what are you going to do? How are you going to select which nine children can return to your classroom if there's no way that you can find more space for those other children to attend? And school-aged children went from one to 18 to one to nine. So you need to look at the ratios and the accommodations that are, they're making in your state, in your province, they differ. It would be terrific if they were national, but they differ from state to state and province to province. So you need to look and see what those changes are and how you can best accommodate them. When you look at some of the suggested and required modifications, now the ones in red are required by most states and Ohio. Staggering drop off and pick up. And by that, what I mean is that, first of all, maybe you don't have all of the children coming at once. Can you ask which parents really need, the, need it right away? Some parents maybe could say, you know, I wasn't gonna send them anyway for the first two weeks. What they're finding in the centers that are opening is that not all the children are coming because parents don't feel that comfortable yet. So find out exactly who needs it, who's coming, so that you can maintain that ratio safely. They're suggesting to stagger drop off and pick up so that it should happen outside. There should be a designated person to meet them and that give them drop off and pick up time so they're not all arriving at once, so that hands can be washed, children can be comforted, and they can also be screened before they enter. Um, some places are suggesting to try and maintain distance between children. I think that's gonna be really hard. Lots of hand washing, um, starting from the minute they arrive. They are suggesting that we maintain separate groups so children in one group do not interact with another. Provide as much distance as possible when you have kids at tables maybe put trays down so that they know what their workspace is and space out the chairs at the table. Try and limit group times because it will be hard to have circle and tell them where they have to sit. Hula hoops can be very helpful and make it fun. Restructuring outdoor time, but outdoor time is probably one of the safest times. So try and spend as much time outdoors as you can. And constant cleaning of toys and equipment, including doorknobs and faucets throughout the day, the things that everyone is touching need to be clean. So think about how these modifications are going to impact you and the children. It's one thing to know what they are, but it's another to know how you're going to do this and how is it going to impact the kids and how are they going to feel safe and welcome and separate from their families if they have to do it at the door with a designated person. So, um, Okay, I think I've covered that one. The other thing that might help is to help parents to create a special goodbye routine. Talk to them about that. It's going to be very difficult. And routines comfort children who have been experiencing stress and it comforts kids anyway. So what routine can you develop with your families for that saying goodbye at the door? How can you help them figure out something? Sometimes giving them something that they can take with them, which may or may not be okay with the regulations. Um, having certain ways, I remember at the center, what we did for kids who had, had trouble separating is, we had a window that they would go to and the parents, after they said goodbye and the parent left the center, 
they would go outside the center and they'd go to the window and the parent would wave and blow a kiss and it would make everybody feel well. Maybe they can give a child a kiss on the palm of their hand to hold all day. Have a special song they sing before they leave or maybe a family photo if it's okay, if it's acceptable. But having that routine makes a big difference. Also, help them understand it doesn't help to linger. Say a quick upbeat goodbye and reassure their child they'll be back, they'll have fun, but don't linger. Encourage the parents not to look sad or worried because the kids will pick up on it. We need to, as I mentioned, wash hands all the time, 20 seconds. Everybody has that song in mind already. Um, and you might have to assist kids with hand washing, especially the younger ones. Post posters around the sink so they know how. And if you're using alcohol-based sanitizers, if there's no water around, make sure you supervise kids so that nothing bad happens in their eyes or that they ingest it. We need to remember that they have to include the same children each day and the same educators each day so that we can kind of lim minimize the contact between and with people, which can make a big difference. And then together with your colleagues and the director, stagger that out playground outdoor time so that everyone is not outside all the time. Um, if you have what the CDC is suggesting, and I did not see this in either um, best practices or required modifications, what the CDC is suggesting, and it's something to think about, that if you have children of essential workers um, at the center who have been working throughout this pandemic, you might consider creating, because they have probably been at a center the entire time. Most of them have had centers they could attend to, but creating a separate classroom that only serves those children because they are at much higher risk of contamination or you know, spreading the virus. And what they are saying is that if you can't do that, they are recommending that you don't include other children. So CDC is taking this very seriously, but the reality makes it very hard. So I just want to suggest it. I, you know, I recognize that some of the suggestions are very, very difficult. Um, I just put some hula hoops there, you know, to accommodate the re physical distancing that's required. And try and think of the activities in terms of physical contact and distance. I'm sure you never thought about that before. So how can you, you know, not use the activities that really require kids to get close together? And minimize time standing in lines or everybody coming to the door. Make sure that they come to the door separately. Put footsteps or something down in front of the door that distances them um, and make it fun. If they're there for nap, separate cots as far apart as you can and place the children head to toe and we're lucky it's warmer weather open your windows and allow for fresh air as much as you can when we look at what program arrangements need to be done to include physical distancing um once again there's they're very similar there's a lot of repetition in some of these regulations um minimize the amount of time children are in close contact um, Separate children for table. Okay, I think we basically limit use of water or sensory tables um, and incorporate frequent hand washing into your schedule because you can't really clean these properly. Limit item sharing. You know, here we spend so much time telling kids they need to share. Now what do we do? This is really confusing. So think about how are you going to explain that to kids? No, you know, you're playing with that. When you're finished playing with that, we're going to put that in this box so that I can wash it and we'll find something else for Joey to play with. This is very hard. We need to be sure that they understand a little bit about why. And once again, this is again, how does this fit into the social emotional learning? When you want, what you know, children are gonna to need to be helped. There's no way that this isn't going to happen. And children, some children, if you're working with younger children, their diapers are going to need to be changed. So we need to know that we can do this. And what they are suggesting is that you bring with you several <laughs> large button down long sleeve shirts that you can you put on and when you hold the child, you do whatever you need to do. When you are finished, you take that shirt off, you put another one on and you put that shirt in a bag and you take it home and you wash it. If you have long hair, put it up in a ponytail 
wash your hands and neck anywhere touched by the child's secretion. So if he's crying and his tears or whatever get on, on you, make sure you wash them before you go back. Um, place contaminated clothes in a plastic bag and place the child's contaminated clothes in a plastic bag as well. And you need to return everything, the, the, the bedding, everything the child brought with them should be returned at the end of the day and the parents should wash it and bring it back the next day. And make sure the children have multiple changes of clothes at the center. These are just things to think about. And once again, the CDC is suggesting if you have children with underlying health conditions, talk to the parents about the risk. And if you have children with disabilities, talk to their parents about how their children can continue to receive their support, the support they need. Um, because children with underlying health conditions are at much greater risk. And parents of children with disabilities are probably even more concerned but we can support them. We just need to work together with them. This is a sort of poster that the CDC has put out. And I'm just, whoops, I'm just sharing that with you because I just want you to see that you should consider opening. Will reopening be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Are you ready to protect children and employees at higher risk? Are you able to screen children and employees upon arrival for symptoms? And if there is any no, you should not open. So check the CDC. They have a lot of things. Check your government regulations. It's different everywhere, but it's important to know there is a risk. It's also so important to recognize that this is something that is, hap not, is not something that's happening around children. This is actually something that's happening to them. And I thought that, you know, this picture have some masks that they can put onto their stuffies at school or whatever, dolls or whatever you might have, help them recognize. I thought that it might be fun if you are wearing masks, because some centers will require that. If you're wearing a mask, put your mask on and ask them if they can tell you if you're smiling, if you're angry, because eyes communicate an awful lot so that they can recognize that they can still see how you feel even if you have a mask. And make a mask kind of fun to wear and part of and okay, not frightening, not something that will scare them. So when you think about mitigating the impact of the new normal, it's very important to ask, answer their questions when they ask them to you. And I'm sure you know more than anybody how to do that in an age appropriate way. But before you answer, ask what they know first so that you're not giving them more information than they need to have. So find out what they know, and then reassure without providing complex information that's gonna to add to their confusion. Reassure them that understand that children internalize those positive cues. So be positive. The same way when families leave at the end, in the morning and you're asking them to look upbeat and positive, you need to not look worried. And then, as I mentioned, work on normalizing those masks. And how will you meet the children's new needs? because they're going to have a lot of difficulty there um, because of the fact that there's going to, it's hard to feel safe, the self-regulation, all of those things with executive function and social cognition. And they might not fully understand what's happening, but they do know that they see a lot of stress is around them. And your first responsibility is to help them feel safe, and if your classroom is a safe place to be, and that's going to take time, that's not going to happen right away. Um, they can begin to learn. The best way to do this is to connect with them and build relationships. It's always all about relationships. Tell them that you'll take care of them, you'll keep them safe. And not only tell them, but show them how you're going to do them. Reassure them they're going to be all right. They're very aware of your nonverbal communication. So be sure that your facial expression and body language match your words. As I mentioned, be sure that you smile during the day. I've gone to childcare centers even before this happened and not seen anybody smile all day. If you're wearing a mask, make a game um, and maybe you can get some masks for them that have Sesame Street, Paw Patrol or other favorites that if they're, because they're suggesting that children over two wear masks. Now this might not be something you wanna do. They're uncomfortable and you get hot. But maybe 
to help them feel more comfortable about it, maybe even in the dress up corner, if they're not sharing them and if you can control this, or maybe each one of them has a mask um, that they can use. But think about it in child terms, childlike terms and how it would be fun. And you can expect separation anxiety, withdrawal, overexcited. Some of them are just gonna start running around. They're gonna be so happy to be back. They're gonna be, I remember Mondays. Well, this is Mondays times 365. Some will be very clingy. Some are gonna have those tantrums. Some will become easily frustrated. Some who were potty trained before are not gonna be potty trained anymore. So there are gonna be a lot of toileting issues. And some may actually regress into baby talk who were communicating very clearly before this. So remember, this is their way of coping. They are not trying to push your buttons. They're not trying to make it hard for you. It's important for you to understand that this is how they can cope. The behavior of a children who've experienced trauma is often seems unpredictable. And because the root cause is different, the strategies that you've used in the past may not be effective. While not all children who have behavior issues have been affected by trauma, creating a trauma-informed classroom can benefit all children. It really is best practice. So let's look a little bit at what you can do to understand that. So first of all, in order to, to, to um, use trauma-informed practice, implement trauma, you need to know yourself, which we've talked about. You need to understand what trauma is. You need to understand the impact of trauma on a child's brain. You need to understand how it affects their behavior. And then you need to change your methods of responding. So that's what we need to talk about. It starts with you. You need to avoid the impact of trauma, talk with others, find joy, accept, and try to understand your feelings. Self-regulation is your most valuable asset. Do not let that cortisol take over and help the child learn to tolerate his or her own uneasy feelings. And because chances are their amygdala hijack and cortisol taking over is happening to them, you need to role model what happens when it happens to you so they can learn from you. You need to keep it together because they're watching you all the time. When they see you being your best self, they can start to believe they can be theirs. What are you role modeling? Think about it. And I have to say, I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but when you get angry or impatient, you're not role modeling kindness, patience, or caring. And it'll be hard because you need to reconnect with your prefrontal cortex. What is your body language? Be gentle with yourself and listen to the children's worries. It's tempting to quickly reassure a child and move on. Don't worry, everything will be fine. I know that staying at home was hard, but now we can go out and now you're back at childcare and we're all gonna be okay. That doesn't help. Children feel safe when you listen. Acknowledge their feelings and concerns. I understand you're scared. I'm scared too. What can we do about it? How can I help you feel safer? Help them to think through how to deal with it. Notice their nonverbal communications and they're going to act out their worry, okay? The same way and that's why there's going to be a lot of that behavior because they're just acting out their worries. A friend of mine sent me a book that they wrote. And she asked me if I would help, you know, help others know about it. And so she, um, I just want to say it's called Not Forever, But For Now. She sent me a copy. I read it to my three and a half year old grandson. And it was the first time that I felt that he felt that somebody really got it. It starts, it's all about sheltering in place. It's all about what they've been through. It talks about going on bug hunts. It talks about we people wearing masks. It's written very simply. It's very simply illustrated, but I think it really helps children accept their feelings during the pandemic. It helps them, wow, other kids feel this way too, which is what stories are really all about. It's available on Amazon. It's called Not Forever, But For Now. And I suggest, I think you can look at some of the pages, but I really, I don't recommend products usually, but I found this so comforting to my grandson who slept with it for three days that, um, or three nights, I should say, that I think it's something to really look at because I think it might be very helpful. We also need to remember that we can't just define our kids, these kids as trauma, kids who've been traumatized. It's not the only things in their lives. 
what we need to do is we need to remember there's lots that still interest them. There's lots of things that they do well still. So how can we incorporate them into the program? And research shows that children can be extremely resilient when faced with challenges. So look for that resilience, support that resilience, look for the positive outcomes because the more positive outcomes they can experience while they are with you, the less important those negative outcomes will be, the stronger they will become. So focus on building their resilience. That relationship is the first place to begin. Building that attachment, that is so important. And I am sure if, and also talk to families about attachment, talks to families about how close they were and how important that was. That will reassure families that they were really able to help their child get through it because of that relationship. Create that positive social climate in your classroom. And once again, teaching social emotional skills and looking at ways for kids to feel comfortable and welcome in that, in your group. Um, provide opportunities for success. Know what the kids can do and make sure that they have opportunities to do them. But also don't forget that whole idea of growth mindset because don't start giving them stuff that's too easy so that you know they can do it without even trying. Let them try and succeed and that's what success is really all about. And provide choices. One of the things I mentioned earlier is how powerless children feel because of this pandemic. Providing choices empowers kids. It enables them to have a sense of control. And often challenging behavior is a result of kids not feeling as though they have any control. So empowerment is important in a positive way. The most powerful tool you have is that relationship with every child. And every minute of the day is an opportunity for you to build that relationship. So think about it throughout the day and how your attitude, your values, your behavior patterns what are you doing throughout the day to build those skills because and build that relationship with the child? There is nothing more important. Um, and you have hours to do that. I just thought we all know Bruce Perry. I thought this was a, you know, the more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. Take that in. That's so important. Another thing to do to create that positive social climate is be positive. It's called goal-oriented language. Tell children what to do, not what not to do. In other words, eliminate as best you can all of your no's, your don'ts, and your stops. Normally I would say eliminate your why's, but sometimes asking instead of why, but what were you thinking, okay, instead of why, but Sometimes in this particular case, I think kids need you to listen what's going on in their head as to why they did behave a certain way. Even if they can't actually um, express it clearly, give them a chance. But rather than using why, say, you know, what were you thinking? What's on your mind? But tell kids what to do. Instead of stop running, please walk. Um, instead of no, find an alternative of what they can do instead. Always start with the child's name. Don't just shout, please walk, but Amy, please walk, because then they know you're addressing them. Be aware of what you're saying and how you're saying it. Recognize their efforts or close approximations. Even if they're not doing it perfectly, if they're trying, that's what's important. And then support them and help them do it. Sometimes you might have to ignore some behaviors so that you can focus on the positive behaviors and give kids attention when they're engaging in appropriate behavior. I don't know if anyone has ever told you about something called the penny transfer technique. And those Canadians, I guess we need to use a nickel transfer technique. But because we often end up with four negatives to every one positive, regardless of who we're communicating with, put five pennies in your right hand pocket. And every time you tell a child or an adult when the children are around, something positive, move that penny from the right-hand pocket into the left-hand pocket and see how many positive things you have said or recognized appropriate behaviors. And once the five pennies are easy, move it up to 10 because the more we can recognize those appropriate behaviors, the more we can support kids appropriately. 
Children need to feel safe. And predictability, consistency, routines, and rituals are key. So if you don't have rituals in your classroom, think about ways you can create them. Can you have a ritual for circle, how you go to circle, or how you would have everybody sit in their hoops together? Create some rituals. Be predictable. Have that schedule. Let the kids know what's coming next and be consistent. And by being consistent, being fair and consistent does not mean treating every child the same. It means giving every child what they need. But it's important to be consistent about when things occur and how they occur, how you present them so the kids know that they can count on you. And encourage mindfulness in young children. There are lots of programs. There's something called Mind Yeti from um, Committee for Children in Seattle, which is a few minutes, it's a free, you can download it, and it's a mindfulness exercise that really can reshape and reorganize kids' minds so that they can focus and calm down. Avoid surprises. Um, it, can, it can trigger, it can trigger them. Focus on their social skills. Read books about being afraid. Provide multiple opportunities for play. I have to say that play is how kids learn. Play is how kids work through their issues. And dramatic play becomes incredibly important here. So somehow you need to look at that dramatic play area. How can you set it up so that they can play there together and work out what they went through. Chances are they are going to play act sheltering in place. They might play act all kinds of things. They might play act doctor and getting sick. What you need to do when they go through these issues through their play is you need to help them recognize the positive things. Focus on the healthcare workers, focus on the police, focus on all the people that are helping others get through this instead of focusing on the negative things. Um, and this will take time because if you haven't dealt with it yourself, you're going to have a hard time when you watch kids working it out, especially if they're working it out in a way that is, is concerning to you. And if I just quickly say, my sister who taught pre-K during 9-11, when the kids came back to school in New York, she had one little boy who was playing in the blocks. And when another a friend of his arrived, he yelled across the room, Andy, come and play with me. I've got the building, you get the plane. And my sister said, what are you gonna do? And he said, we're gonna knock down the building with the plane. And my sister said, not in my classroom. And when she told me this, I said, look, you know, they needed to do that. What you needed to say is, well, don't forget the ambulances, don't forget the police, don't forget all the people that helped so that they could work through it. And so it's hard, she, she was fresh, she wasn't ready for it. So you need to be ready. You've had time, you need to focus on it, you need to think about it. You need to realize that it comes from countless interactions to help make kids strong. I found this on Facebook and I felt it needed to be shared and I'm just going to read it out loud in the hopes that everyone will read it with me. And that is everyone is applauding everyone but our children. These little heroes have stayed indoors more than they've ever known in their lives. Their whole worlds have literally been turned upside down. All these rules they've never known, loss of friends, family, daily activities, lessons, and outings, a life they couldn't have imagined. Adults talking about others becoming unwell, news reporting death after death. Our poor children's minds must be racing. Every day they get up and carry on despite all that's going on. And all they've done is paint pictures and put stuff on their windows for the heroes out in the world. So here's to our little heroes today, tomorrow, and forever. And I think that's something we all need to have and maybe even put on the wall in our room at the center. I just want to quickly talk a little bit about challenging behavior because that five to 10% is no longer accurate. It's going to be somewhere more like 15 to 35 or 40%. So we need to know a little bit about it from a trauma informed perspective. And we need to understand that when children are oppositional, defensive, numbed out, or enraged, that that bad behavior is just repeating an action that they needed to survive by going through some of what they were going through. Even when it's intensely off-putting, this is what they've learned to do. This is how they've met their needs. They may be easily triggered off. They're going to struggle with regulation. I think we've talked about a lot of things. They may act 
react defensively and aggressively in response to perceived blame or attack. And they are going to behave in unpredictable ways, oppositional and defiant. You need to be consistent, provide those routines, avoid those surprises, create the caring classroom. All of this is part of it. We've talked about it before. So remember this, this is key. And when you begin, build those connections, teach healthy coping mechanisms, focus on creating a sense of safety, be flexible in order to meet each child's needs. Remember each child experiences a disaster differently and let them tell you what they need and provide many opportunities for play. When you look at this poster, the one don't is do not punish kids for behaviors that are trauma systems. We need to look at punishment. Punishment creates a hostile environment. It doesn't teach kids anything. It may stop the behavior, but when you punish one child, they're all watching and those kids need to feel safe and they won't if they see you looking angry. And often it is a result of an amygdala hijack. You take it personally, your buttons have been pushed. So we need to look at other ways to respond because out of control emotions are only gonna escalate the behavior. We need to think about how, rather than what's, what's wrong with this child, we need to think about what's happened to this child. How hard has this been? How can I help this child tap into his feelings and behave appropriately? It probably will begin with anxiety. And when you think about children's anxiety and you think about the kids you've worked with before and what you're going to be seeing when you return, a lot of things you can see. They might be sweaty, they might have tears, they might be pale, some of them might be breathing heavily, some of them might be breathing slowly, they might be twirling their hair, sucking their thumb, pacing. You know your kids. You know what they're going to look like. They're going to be nervous, they're going to be worried, they're going to be scared. And maybe they're thinking of, get me out of here, I don't want to be here, what's going on, will my mother pick me up? Tap into this with each and every child that you work with. And when you think about it, these are ways that children show anxiety. I thought the chandeliering was fun, funny. You know, they just start, oh, I can't do this, I can't cope. They're gonna have difficulty sleeping, so they're gonna to come to you tired. So try and remember, they're dealing with a lot of anxiety. And think of a time when you were really anxious and someone responded in a helpful way. I'm sure that's happened to all of us. What did he dare or do? What did she or he, um, how did they do it? Those are things you need to remember when you are supporting a child who's anxious. And then think about a time someone was really anxious and you responded. How did you know they needed you or wanted your help? And what did you say? And what was your body language? These are key elements in supporting kids when they come back. How you respond will show that you care, separate the child from the behavior, you gotta listen. Don't take things personally. I think that's really hard for a lot of us. Focus on the positive. Respect personal space. Don't get too close and do not touch a child without asking. Connect, listen, comfort, confirm, and calibrate means, is it working? Do I need to begin again? Is there something else I should be doing? You're nonverbal, maybe it's the nonverbal. Maybe you're saying the right things, but you're not looking the right way. Maybe your tone of voice is too loud or too soft. Um, match theirs, try and match them. And when I say respect their personal space, when you are too close, it's threatening. When you are too far, kids think you're uninvolved. Find that space. And when you get too close, you will notice their eyes will get bigger, their shoulders will go up. Same with their families when you're talking to them about things they're going to be in very similar state of mind. So watch for that body language and find that comfort, find that comfortable zone so that when you're talking to them, they're listening and you're really communicating. And when a child is out of control, you need to remember that they're not listening to anything you say. You need to just let them get through it. You need to be there. You need to be supportive. You need to use your eye contact in a way that reassures them. You need to keep that physical space you need to balance your anger maybe because, oh God, I can't, it's hard. Your fear of what he's going through, what he might be doing, what you might be doing, and stay in charge of yourself. Try not to face a child face forward, but use what's called an L stance, which is shown in this, um, this drawing here, so that you're a little bit sideways. Your, your posture is important, your hands at your side, 
Don't try and look big and strong. You need to look as though you're listening and you care and have a calm facial expression. Um, we need to know and remember that children need positive role models and resilient adults who are aware of their own personal stress and trigger. So I honestly believe that professional development is going to be more important than ever because you need to not only know how to work with these new regulations, but you need to understand trauma-informed practice. You need to have robust protocols for identifying children at risk. And you need to be able to recognize your own anxiety, children's signs of anxiety, and ways to manage ongoing challenges. It's really hard. Um, don't be afraid to need extra help. And whether we build strong partnerships with families, use Zoom to connect with kids who've been out sick, which did we do that before? Is that something we've learned maybe we can do to maintain that connection? What we are learning during this pandemic will help us better serve kids throughout the rest of our careers. And I wanted to leave you with that positive note because if no one has told you lately, the work that you do each day in whatever way you serve children and families is vital, appreciated, and noble. And we all thank you. I wanted to share this video with you. It's not very long. I hope you can stay. Um, I thought it was an extremely touching way to look at things. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's 2020. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick. You could have anything you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew square and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker, so we couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out, already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked, oh, sorry, and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies. Jeez, I'm sorry. More convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. But while we all were hidden, Amidst the fear, and all the while, people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe. And the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the sea. Some people started dancing. Some were singing. Some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but soon good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. So, with that, it was a work. With that, I just wanted to share some of the resources. Now, what I will do is I will ask him if there's some way I can do this with you or post the or post some information. Um, Reaching and Teaching Children Exposed to Trauma by Barbara Sorrells is a wonderful book that might really help you understand where the kids are coming from. So I just wanted to say thank you and please stay safe. Thank you so much. Are you there, Kim? Yes, I am. Hold on one second. Barbara, um, 
Hold on, I thought I had it. There we go. Um, we are going to need to wrap up fairly quickly because our next webinar is beginning, but I just want to say to you, there were so many incredible questions that we weren't able to get to, which has really been the theme of the day today. So uh, Chris and I and our team is already talking about that we may need to do a fantabulous conference part two so that we can get to all of the questions that we have. But I do want to say to you, the other common theme, and I'm going to read this quote to you, was this is the best comprehensive explanation of the trauma that children have experienced and how vigilant we need to be to reopen safely. And over and over again, people said they've been on so many webinars, but your combination of wisdom, expertise, but practical experience from knowing childcare programs was something that everyone on the webinar so greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. That's gonna make me cry, thank you. Oh, you made me cry, it was a fantastic <laughs> webinar. All right, so we will not have time for questions, but I am. I do wanna wrap up quickly for each of you. Um, thank you for everyone who attended this morning, this afternoon, and thank you for those who were able to donate during registration. We are a nonprofit association dedicated to serving early childhood educators. And like Barbara as a presenter and Ohio AYC as a nonprofit, um, COVID-19 has had a financial impact on all of us. So we hope that you will consider um, going to our website. There's a donation button on the website page. We have a lot of great work we wanna continue and we would love to continue to bring you these great webinars. So we hope you'll consider donating to support our mission and really hope if you haven't signed up for DJ's webinar at 3.30 and Lisa's, that you'll sign up for those. They're gonna be fantastic, or as Chris says, fantabulous. So thank you everyone and we'll see you soon. Bye.